Hey everyone, the name is Eric Dorn. Today I want to talk about Carl Jung and why Carl Jung was the most gifted psychologist of the 20th century. Now let me tell you this. While psychology is originated and come to focus on a completely different branch of psychology than the one proposed by Carl Jung, we would all have been a lot better off if we had came to understand and learn and apply Carl Jung's principles on psychology. Now let me be clear with you, psychology is a subject in a state of crisis. A lot of the studies done in psychology cannot be reproduced. A lot of it rests on very thin eyes. The science between psychology is very iffy. And the problem is with verifiability. It is hard to generalize on a human psychology because humans tend to be quite different. The development of a person and an individual can take many different routes. And Carl Jung was one of the few psychologists that came to understand that people could be different from one another. We could all come to develop a different state of consciousness and we do not all share the same consciousness. Still Carl Jung was one of the uh, psychologists that came to become the most influential in our development of our ideas of the conscious and the unconscious. He basically was the first to describe and talk about and understand and reflect on human consciousness, what it felt like, how we experienced it, how it could be conceptualized, where it came from, how it worked, its base mechanisms. And his theories could be used to predict many different influential types in society, where they came from, what gave them power, what made them persuasive, what made them so successful, what made them suffer, what made them struggle with psychological traumas and difficulties. Now. While mainstream psychology focused on psychology and the idea that there was a healthy psychology, a healthy state of mind, a norm within human consciousness, and a different something outside the norm, outside human consciousness that was psychologically unstable, Carl Jung came to believe there were multiple different forms of consciousness. We could be conscious of different things and consciousness could look different in different people. Carl Jung's studies, uh, for example, emanated in the sensitive person. Carl Jung was one of the first to recognize that some people had an innate inherent sensitivity. And this research has come to later on become hugely important in psychology in understanding highly sensitive people, individuals with a nervous system response, a processing of sensory stimuli that was different than the so-called average in citizen in human society. So Carl Jung has gone beyond that in elaborating on different cognitive functions and his theories can basically describe how the human mind operates. Now bear in mind this is a short article, a short book that goes into and describes human differences in sometimes uh, generalistic terms. But it was a good starting point. It was not meant to be it was never ready to be proposed as a real science, as real scientific evidence-based personality types, but it was the starting point that allowed us to understand, for example, the importance of emotions as opposed to the importance of logic or the importance of dreams and the imagination as opposed to the importance of sensing and being realistic and of experience. So Carl Jung described, sought to describe why we need these different processes and how they can work and how we can experience them on a phenomenological level. And Carl Jung's theories also brought down the research on introversion and extroversion. This research has become perhaps one of the biggest and most interesting studies in popular psychology today. Now, Carl Jung's theories have come to be often misused, but they have played a role in the development of different personality inventories such as the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and the Big Five. The problem is, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator only loosely borrowed on the terminology used by Carl Jung, 
and Big Five also decided to go in a different direction. When the Big Five and the mainstream psychologists picked up on introversion and extroversion, their definitions came to become very different from Carl Jung's original definitions. What I believe Carl Jung tried to do was describe the self-actualization process and our road to happiness and energy and motivation. What Carl Jung saw was that we all had a natural comfort zone, a place where we felt more comfortable than, say, another place. And the introvert's biggest, strongest comfort came from the internal, from the inner experience, from the sensations that were derived inside, the ideas we had personally, on a personal basis, the thoughts, ideas, and experiences that related to us, to our own self. The extrovert, on the other hand, placed more comfort in the external, what they could see, what they could hear, what they could uh, do, what could happen, what could become true, what uh, was possible in the environment. So the extrovert was a person who came to naturally derive comfort and calm and relaxation from engaging their environment, while the introvert came to feel better and more comfortable engaging their inner world. The Big Five and mainstream psychology came to take introversion in a different direction, suggesting that the introvert was shy or reserved, instead anxious of uh, what was happening around them, often fearful, often cautious, often careful, more methodical, more quiet. Mainstream psychology came to focus on extrovert type as brave, likely to take action, talkative, social, friendly, charming. So in doing this, it suggested there was a norm. Once again, psychology has a bad habit of assuming there is a norm, a healthy. And the big five has basically five domains and overall... Five of these domains are more healthy than the other five, the dark side of the big five. So outgoingness has come to be seen as more positive than being reserved or inhibited, of course. Openness has become seen as something more positive than being closed or narrow-minded, of course. Being agreeable and positive and likely to collaborate and work together with other people has become something more healthy than being critical, competitive or likely to disagree with or see things differently than other people. Of course this is the case. Being conscientious, being on time, being able to follow orders, being able to do things well and carefully has become seen as something more positive than being sloppy, disorganized or likely to be spread thin or distracted, of course. And finally, being calm and emotionally stable is of course more healthy than being neurotic or emotionally unstable. So the Big Five's direction suggests there is a healthy level of behavior, a healthy personality. And this might be the case. I'm not saying this is not the case. I'm saying this is possible. Yes, it might be that it is overall better to be outgoing. Yes, it might be better to be open. Yes, it is better to be agreeable and able to collaborate with other people. But I want to say there is also an importance in being able to disagree with other people when necessary. It is important to be able to be cautious and reserved rather than jump off a cliff or engage a stupid possibility. It is better to be traditional and conservative than to chase off a crazy and stupid idea that would never work in the first place. It has its importance to be disorganized in the role of creativity and in shaping new ideas and new possibilities. And there might even be a role in anxiety and in negative emotions in helping us deal with trauma and negative experiences. There are times where it's good to cry and to be emotionally unstable and there are times where it's good to keep calm and maintain your poise and to be stoic. So, 
When understanding Carl Jung in, in comparison to these theories, what you want to understand is Carl Jung tried to see things differently. He was talking about interests and motivations and values and differences in motivations and values and interests and consciousness. He spoke of an intuitive consciousness focused on ideas, the imaginative, the what if, the theoretical, the hypothetical. He spoke about the practical, what we could do, what was action, what was happening, what was going on here and now. He spoke about different individuals that live different lives based on different core principles. For example, being free versus being traditional or being a part of a system or having a role or responsibility somewhere. Being disciplined compared to being open-minded or creative. Carl Jung believed that we were inclined towards different interests and that everyone was different. His individual shift psycholo psychological theories are refreshing because we are not all the same. We don't always want the same things. We don't always have the same values and that's okay. In this society where we are all striving towards some kind of homogeneity, individual homogeneity, where we are all free but where we all choose to act and be and deal with situations the same way, is problematic to say the least. Carl Jung's alternative idea of an individual society where people could pursue and live different lives parallel and in harmony with other people was a more promising vision. Carl Jung could help set and explain the cultural clashes we see today in which we only identify with our gender or with our nationality or with our socioeconomic background or income. Carl Jung's alternative idea would have been different. It would have been identifying with our interests, our values as individuals, our feelings about a situation, our values, our thoughts what we felt connected to, what we felt was most important. I see a lot of people out there that say that Myers-Briggs type indicator is rubbish, but I also see a lot of these people believing in sex or gender-related psychological differences. These people are prone to stereotype and say men are like this and women are like that. These people are like the stereotype, white people are like this and black people are like that. Carl Jung's uh, theories could provide more background. You know, Big Five is also working towards creating different types, but the Big Five and a lot of other systems are starting to favor four type models. The Big Five and DISC and other systems often work with four specific personality types. Red, green, blue or yellow personality types. But aren't we a lot more diverse than that? Aren't we a lot more complex than that? Now grant that it might be that personality types do change, our interests might change, things may not persist. It's often said that uh, the MBTI tests cannot be reproduced and after six months the results are likely to change. Yes, they're likely to change maybe a little bit, perhaps we start developing new interests, perhaps we start finding new values, perhaps we learn something new about ourselves. A lot of people go through life not knowing anything about themselves. What do I want to do? Where, what do I want to be when I grow up? What should I work with? What would make me happy? A lot of people are completely clueless on these matters. And I think there is a theory that money, <laughs> financial privilege, is the key most important matter of all. How much we make, how much we earn, how least little we work. Happiness psychology has become extremely streamlined. A lot of happiness psychologists seem to believe happiness is a single-minded equation. We, oh, if we can get money, family, friendship, romance, and self-actualization, we will be happy. If we can work as little as possible and get as much money as possible from it, we will be happier. A lot of uh, mainstream psychology will focus simply on these singular facts, but not on the question of what we do. And I understand why psychology does avoids these topics. It is true it's hard to scientifically verify 16 personality types or 16 different values or groups of interest. It is true it's easier to focus on four or to focus on two different scales of people. It is true 
that uh, if you're looking for massive data, statistics, verifiability, you want a streamlined approach where everyone is the same and where you focus on only the things that can be generalized to the entirety of the human population. It is true that data about a small statistical group of the population, perhaps only 1-5% to of the population, is harder to support than data about 100% of the population. But that doesn't mean that personality types aren't real. Even though it can be hard to verify and back up with statistics, personality types might exist. So what I'm looking for is some level of modesty, but also a level of understanding of what Jungian psychology is all about. Jungian psychology is not necessarily about what the easy way, but it is looking for the accurate way. And the accurate way is diverse. It is focused on multiple different personalities, multiple different theories, multiple different ways of looking at things, rather than one singular way of looking at things. So I hope this video can help you understand why a lot of people like the MBTI personality test, even though the MBTI test might not be documented well with statistics, and even though it might be sometimes a little bit too stereotypical or too shallow. I hope it also helps you understand what I'm trying to do in making it less stereotypical, in understanding these personality types with greater nuance, in connecting it to modern psychology, in research on values, on psychology, on happiness, and on flow. I believe your MBTI type is your flow type, and that's my difference with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I don't believe you are what you are doing right now. I don't believe your type is necessarily where you work at the moment. I don't believe your type is necessarily who you are with friends. I believe your type is who you are in a state of flow when you do things you enjoy. So I'm focused on understanding happiness, stress, joy, and what gives us happiness and what makes us stressed. And I'm trying to, and this is the big thing of my project, prove personality types do exist and that they do matter and that can, they can help us find the right career, the right study path, the right lifestyle for us as individuals. So if you want to help me out in that project, please leave a like, share and subscribe, share this video to skeptics and people who might like it. and. Visit patreon.com slash erikdor and leave a donation to support me in bringing new content in challenging all of these uh, mainstream ideas in producing healthy alternatives in psychology that can help people understand themselves, their family, their friends better. Thanks for watching and hope to see you guys in the next video.